will be presenting this uh, case uh, and then as we go by we will bring out various questions uh, which are normally asked in the exam uh, so this will be very useful for exam going pgs and those who are planning to prepare for exams um, but mostly it will be on practical aspects a little bit of theoretical aspects as well but mostly on practical aspects and um, as I said, this is going to be basic, uh, very, really basic uh, for the postgraduate levels. Um, so we will start with the case presentation and then uh, we will slowly, as we go by, we will discuss the different scenarios and situations uh, which we have to manage, how to manage all those things in post rural well. All right. Usually it is a short case. So this much of a questioning and extensive discussion will not happen. Um, but still, you never know what questions are going to be asked. So it's probably better you be equipped with all the questions, at least some of them you may be able to answer. Right? Over to you, Sanjay. Okay, sir. I'm presenting a six month old uncircumcised male, the male infant who presented with the poor flow of urine with straining since birth and with history of fever for the last five days. Uh, history of uh, presenting illness, uh, according to the informant. Uh, the mother, the baby has been having the poor flow of urine with straining since birth, and she and she notices uh, dribbling of urine uh, uh, after the, uh, each maturation, and and the baby remains dry uh, between each episode. The, and uh, the and uh, the child also has a fever for five days, uh, high grade fever, high grade continuous fever, and the uh, highest recorded temperature was uh, 102 degree uh, currently. And uh, she also gives similar episode of uh, fever four to five times in the last six months, the details of which are not completely available. Uh, however, there's no history of sudden inability to, to, to pass urine or, uh, or any history of periodic catheterization. And the child has normal bowel habits. And in the past medical history, the mother was on irregular antenatal checkup. The, the baby was delivered by uh, the low uh, LSCS at term due to oligohydramnios. Uh, otherwise, the, the uh, postnatal period was uneventful and uh, no history of any uh, respiratory distress after birth. Okay, we'll stop here and then uh, do some discussion. Now, you said that this patient presented with a history of your fever and you're suspecting yes, urinary tract infection, right? Yes, sir. Go. So, Most probably, sir. Um, um, the past history, um, we really have to elicit whether it was uh, this was a documented urinary tract infection. Uh, we don't know. Uh, uh, so the, the, the details of that were not available. So it was just told that uh, the was managed conservatively, but no documents were there with the uh, patient attender, sir. Okay. Um, are there any particular symptoms suggestive of uh, urinary tract infection? Did you ask for anything in particular, like what could have suggested a urinary tract infection? One particular history, which the mother can give. Uh, the baby got febrile illness or this episode of febrile illness. One particular history the mother can give, which may say that this could be a urinary tract infection. Yeah. The child cries while pa passing the uh, passing that urine. It's not a specific uh, symptom, right? Mm. Yes, sir. The, it can occur physiologically also, sir. Yeah. Well, so anything uh, more suggestive because we don't have any records, but some history can usually the foul smelling mother... urine, sir. Yeah, foul smelling urine. Then one more color. Okay, sir. A cloudy urine, right? So if it looks like, you know, buttermilk or milk sometimes, you know, th that kind of history it can be there, um, which can give you a suggestion that the previous episode was a urinary tract infection, right? So in a patient okay. with a recurrent urinary tract infection, what is the first common thing which you have come, which comes to your mind? Vesicular uh, 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 reflex. Sir. Right. So you generally think of vesicular reflex as a first cause if somebody has got a recurrent urinary tract infection. Right? Yes, sir. So yes. that is something which we have to keep it in mind. Um, and um, now you have said that antenatally the mother was under irregular follow up. Did you go into the history or did you find out whether there are any antenatal scan reports and did you try to see them? Uh, sir, the, uh, when we inquired, she did not have any, uh, any records. Sir. She, uh, she tells that scans were done, but uh, the, no records were available, sir. 
has she been informed of uh, was it a normal ultrasound somebody has told her at all or has she had no ultrasound it is very unusual for anybody not to have any ultrasound uh, sir ultrasound was done sir but she is not uh, sure about the the reports sir what was communicated to her she is not sure sir right now um, coming to the presentation of uh, posterior urethral valve huh? i mean in the in the exam also this happens so you know that that is the case but we often know what you are ha having but we kind of try to find out whether that fits in with the picture so in a posterior urethral valve what is the common way they present these days uh, sir the uh, the commonest presentation is so the, usually in the, the newborn period sir so the child will not uh, void for the first 24 hours and uh, and probably a attempted catheterization could also be done and uh, and they won't be able to pass a catheter easily this okay. will be the commonest presentation sir and um, is there they can they present before birth like the parents can come to you uh, sir yes sir the antenatally directed the uh, bilateral so that's uh, becoming process, more sir. and more common these days so antenatally the parents are coming up with ultrasound report so what are the things which you normally see in the antenatal scan when you have a patient with a posterior urethral valve sir the, i would be more interested in a, the uh, in a second trimester scan sir your the scan you should done at i mean at about 16 weeks so the, i would like to see at the bladder the bladder usually will be the distended and thick walled bladder then there will be keyhole sign the then there will be ureteric dilatation uh, the calicial dilatation will be there the, then she will also have a oligohydramnios and specifically looking at the kidney the, Uh, uh, there will be loss of uh, the, sorry uh, increase echogenicity uh, loss of cortico medullary differentiation there will be renal cyst will be present sir okay and uh, so thinning of parenchyma so you are basically looking for a lot of things uh, right from bladder distension then bilateral hydrourethronephrosis then re renal cortical status in the form of cortical thinning and the cysts all those things yes sir then you are yes, also sir. looking for oligohydramnios right yes sir why do they get oligohydramnios uh, sir uh, because of the obstruction sir because the urine does not come into the the, the amniotic cavity sir so the urine gets obstructed because of that sir so okay and uh, what is the how do you how do you find how do you tell that somebody has got oligohydramnios what is that thing called an ultrasound uh, sir the, the amniotic fluid index that we calculate yeah. amniotic fluid index should be less than 5 sir or the yeah. maximum size of the pocket uh, should be less than 2 cm sir okay um now there are certain um, um signs which can be a, um favorable also in a case of a posterior urethral valve if they are present uh, on the antenatal scans um or postnatal scans what are the favorable signs of posterior urethral valve no is there a thing called a pop off mechanism what is a pop off mechanism uh, the, the pop off mechanism is a, a mechanism to to release the pressure of the system sir. so just uh, associate with the we are reflex usually one side kidney gets affected sir so the child will have uh, urinoma sir No, no, no. So, no, no. There, you are coming to two different things. The first thing you said was different. What was it? Ah, uh, sir, the, the, the pop-up mechanism is a compensatory mechanism that associated with the, the uh, uh, vesicular urethral reflex to to maintain the pressure on the, the system, sir. Okay. So, is that uh, bilateral VUR or unilateral VUR? Ah, uh, sir. Usually, the uh, uh, VUR will be the, uh, uh, unilateral bilateral, sir. But the pop-up mechanism will, will always be one side, sir. And so once uh, it takes the brunt of the the, the insult, sir. So what is V U R D? V U R D is vesicular urethral reflex with uh, the dysplasia, sir. Renal dysplasia. Does it go by somebody who described it? Who described it? That particular. I mean, it's uh, not a syndrome, uh, but um, somebody described it, and. Um, uh, so I'm not sure about the name, sir. Uh, unilateral reflex and dysplasia. um so one kidney is kind of shrunken or small or dysplastic with no function and that side takes the reflex and the opposite kidney is relatively well preserved in structure and size and uh, there is no reflex 
and these patients usually do well because one one kidney is mostly preserved throughout. Uh, so that is ducket. Huh? So okay, okay. ducket is the one who described it. Then um, VORDs. That is that is something which we detect postnatally if we have a. Uh, one side is shrunken kidney with uh, or poor function on DMSA, and then we have a reflex on an MCU. Now, antenatally, you said something else, number two, like a pop of urinoma. Urinoma, present urinoma. So, urinoma uh, can be a pop of mechanism where one side that urine um, pop off, which is, you know, that, that can be either from the kidney or it can be from the bladder, di uh, bladder diverticulum. Bladder diverticulum, large bladder diverticulum is again another pop off mechanism. Pop off, yes, sir. Then, if the urinary ascites uh, comes into the peritoneal cavity, what is it called? Urinary diverticulum, that urinoma enters the peritoneal cavity, it becomes filled with the peritoneal cavity, urine. What when, when there is a fluid in the peritoneal cavity, you call it ascites, urinary ascites. Yeah. Urinary ascites. So you, you urinoma, urinary ascites, large diverticulum, and VORD. All VOR. of them are pop off mechanism. Out of which three of them, you can actually even the VORD. Sometimes you can suspect if one side is shrunken and then that side is hyperurinephrosis on scans. Uh, but usually the last one is the VORD is diagnosed on an MCU and a DMSA. Whereas the other three can be picked up easily on ultrasound and they are all favorable prognostic things. All right. Uh, now, let us um, finish discussing about this antenatal thing. Let us say that this mother um, or these parents have come to you with an antenatal scan report at a gestation of like let us say like 19 weeks at 19 weeks gestation they have come with a report showing a keyhole sign oligohydramias bilateral hydrourotronephrosis and uh, also urinary uh, um, the um, you know various features not the not the favorable markers but just a posterior suggestive of posterior urethral valve right yes, sir. now what would you what would you are counseling be uh, sir uh, counseling, I would uh, uh, I would tell them about the probable diagnosis, sir. Uh, the the problem of uh, of a uh, PUV, and then the probability of the child having uh, the end stage renal disease, uh, the uh, developing the, the early end stage renal disease at about twenty to thirty years, because the incidence of uh, uh, end stage renal disease is about fifty to sixty percent. Okay, uh, that is one thing. Uh, I would also add the uh, suggest them for for evaluation and. Uh, and also fetal interventions if they are accepting and would also discuss about the complications as well as complications and the success rates of uh, the fetal interventions and and if they are not willing for any procedure the, at least uh, i would uh, advise them for a serial uh, ultrasound and uh, early termination of pregnancy and uh, the, and further care in the nicu so neonatal icu or or uh, termination of pregnancy sir now termination of pregnancy or uh, you know uh, the, um, that that is like when you have a very poor prognostic thing right yes sir so what kind of situations will make you a, a patient a, a feed as a candidate for advising a termination uh, uh, sir i would like to do a, a vesicocentesis a vesicocentesis and uh, no, no, vesicocentesis is different but on ultrasound itself there are certain things which can tell you that this is a very uh, not a favorable candidate. So that kind of what what is the uh, sir the UTD P3 sir the uh, uh, very high risk uh, severe uh, presence of dysplastic kidney and uh, severely dilated tortuous ureter sir. No, that that is a feature of any posterior urethral valve right? Okay sir. Uh, so if you see an anhydramnios, that means there is no amniotic fluid completely like, um, you know, or when there is a cortical cyst, bilateral cortical cyst, bilateral increased echogenicity, um, all those things. And then the huge fetal bladder distension um, in an early trimester. Okay. If you, if you detect all these things like uh, anhydramnios and uh, uh, cortical increased echogenicity, uh, or cortical cyst in a, in, a, in a 18 weeks or 20 weeks ultrasound. That means you're dealing with a very bad risk uh, uh, patient. 
okay okay sir and uh, what is the window for termination like uh, when we say uh, sir uh, i think uh, before 20, uh, 20 to 12, before 20 weeks uh, uh, i mean yeah, ntt law be 20 weeks now weeks. they have just, now they have relaxed to 24 weeks okay so 20, nowadays okay, in sir. law it is up to 24 weeks is allowed okay sir right now when you when 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 you when you say fetal intervention how common it is being done and how often is it successful uh, sir the fetal interventions are not routinely done, sir. Uh, the, and the success rate is that the, uh, there was a one study based on this thing, so the, the Pluto study. So, but uh, it is also a prematurely terminated study, and it also tells that uh, the based on their observations, it is only the the, uh, the mortality reduced, the twenty eight day mortality is reduced. But uh, however, it does not have any uh, significant uh, uh, effect on the renal function, sir. So the CKD risk is not altered. That's yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, it is the same, sir. So the fetal intervention has got these. Some of the downsides are like that. Long-term CKD risk is not altered. Yes, sir. Okay. Then there is a risk of fetal demise, which yes, is sir. as high as forty-five to fifty percent. Right. So that risk yes, is there. Then, uh, then the shunt failure. Uh, what uh, I mean, shunt migration, all those things. Now, shunt before failure. the shunt. What are the types of fetal intervention which are now being done? Uh, sir, one is the sh uh, uh, shunt, sir. Another thing is the, the, uh, what is the endoscopy name of the shunt? fulguration. Uh, Rodeck shunt and okay. uh, Harrison mm -hmm. shunt, sir. Okay. Then? And cystoscopic uh, the, the fulguration of the valve, sir. Cystoscopic, uh, uh, well, it's fetoscopic valve fulguration. Okay. okay. Fetoscopy, it, yes, sir. I mean, fetal cystoscopy is extremely difficult. So they puncture the bladder and then go anti-grade via, anti uh, via the bladder into the urethra. But the problem is they cannot see the valve so clearly. Okay. So when you go from above, the valve is not seen very clearly because it is right at the angulation where the yes. urethra turns away. So, yes. you know, looking from above is not easy. Okay. Then what other intervention can be done? Fetal vesicostomies, fetal vesicostomies have been done. Then recurrent aspirations, repeated amniotic fluid aspirations um, have been, um, you know, have been done. Not, not amniotic fluid, the repeated bladder aspirations. Uh, all those things have been done. Then they have okay, also sorry. tried to place um, um, a catheter, like a, like a porta cath, a chamber. Okay, sir. Instead of um, putting a putting a shunt. shunt, the shunt is normally placed between where and where. Where is the uh, one end? Where is the other end? Uh, sir, the uh, between the, the the fetal bladder and the amniotic cavity, sir. Yeah. Uh, instead of that, they put a tube into the fetal bladder, and then and then connect it to a chamber on the abdominal wall of the mother. So that chamber can be repeatedly aspirated for a fetal bladder aspiration. So that, that is also that also have been tried. So fetal vesicostomy. So fetal vesicostomies have been tried. And um, so multiple things have been tried without much success, right? Okay. Uh, yes, and uh, once you do all these things, like you have around some ten weeks to deliver. So you have to time it also appropriately, and. Uh, and you do it only when you have a favorable renal uh, parameters. Okay. Yes. Sir. So what is uh, what what is the salvageable renal function? What do you mean by salvageable renal function? Uh, sir, the, uh, the fetal vesicosynthesis should be done, sir. At least uh, uh, two to three uh, two to three samples, uh, forty eight hours apart, has to be done. So the okay. parameters include uh, uh, sodium less than ninety, uh, chloride sorry, sodium less than hundred, the, the chloride less than ninety. And the uh, osmolality, uh, osmolality should be the, more than two hundred. Uh, 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 beta two microglobulin should be four. Uh, the, the, the protein should be less than uh, twenty uh, milligram per deciliter, and calcium should be less than eight uh, milligram per deciliter, sir. Okay. So fetal osmolality and beta two microglobulin are the most important things. Normally, the fetal osmolality is like less than two ten. Um, so if that is more than that or the microglobulin is more than six, 
then that means that those kidneys are not salvageable and there is no okay. point in fetal intervention. Okay. Um, but even if that is there, uh, favorable, then we have to weigh at the other risks, explain the 50% chance of fetal demise and then failure to you know, alter the CKD risk. So all those things we have to explain. Um, and then if the parents want to go for repeated ultrasound observations to see how it is, and then um, and then that is a third option, right? Okay. Yes, sir. Now let us continue with your presentation. Uh, just uh, yes, tell about further. Yes, sir. Uh, so the registry, uh, she gives history of taking homeopathic medications. Otherwise, uh, the feeding is the immunization and the past, Ill past illness until significant, sir. Okay. Uh, and then the, not a consanguineous marriage, family history uh, insignificant and socioeconomic history is insignificant, sir. Okay. Uh, on general examination, the child is uh, the uh, child is ill looking and uh, the well nourished, mild pallor present, uh, no dehydration, jaundice, uh, edema, or cyanosis. And now, the, the pulse rate. Before I forget, I want to ask you, this oligohydramnias, um, can it affect something else? Like, what, what, how other... Oligo uh, it's a pulmonary function, so it can affect the lung function. So the, the oligohydramnias can, can give rise to pulmonary hypoplasia, sir. And? And how does it affect the baby? How does it present? The uh, Potter syndrome, sir. No, no. Pulmonary hypoplasia presents with respiratory distress at birth. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. What is Potter yes, syndrome? Uh, uh, Potter syndrome is a constellation of uh, the uh, symptoms that is the, that occurs due to the oligohydramnia, sir. With the, the, starting from the, the, the morphological features, uh, low set ears, the, the, the weak nose, uh, prominent epicanthic folds, and then the, the unilateral or bilateral renal agenesis with the, the pulmonary hyperplasia, sir. Okay. So those with the faces typically they are having a squashed face. Uh, because of the lack of, um, you know, space. So all yes, those sir. things can be a feature of this Potter species, right? Yes, sir. Now continue with this. Uh, yeah, now you have the general examination. Yeah. Yes, sir. The, the, the child was febrile. The, the pulse rate was 110 per minute. Respiratory rate was 32 per, per minute. And weight was 6.5 kg. On inspection, the abdomen was scaphoid. The flanks were not full. The umbilicus was centrally placed and inverted. The hernial orifices were, were, were intact. No visible peristalsis seen. On palpation, the, the, the abdomen was uh, soft, otherwise no abnormality, but the urinary bladder was uh, uh, palpable in the form of a hypergastric fullness. The percussion over the urinary bladder was dull. Uh, uh, auscultation or normal bowel sounds were present. And uh, inspection of genital urinary system specifically, uh, uh, there was a drop of urine present at the meatus. The otherwise the uh, the prepuce the, the prepuce was uh, the uncircumcised. The normal scrotum, suprapubic area, there was no scar mark, and uh, the the hernia orifices were normal. On palpation, both the testes were present in the scrotum. The suprapubic area was full and uh, and tender on palpation, uh, and both kidneys were not palpable, sir. Okay, carry on. So what do you want to, well, yeah, other systems are normal. What do you want to do now? Uh, sir, the, I would like to first uh, catheterize the child, sir. The, I would like to place uh, the infant feeding tube first or a, or a small catheter, six French catheter, sir. First, uh, and drain the bladder. And at the same time, I would like to collect the urine for uh, the urine microscopy and, uh, and urine culture. At the same time, I would like uh, I would like to do some blood investigation, sir. Uh, the blood investigations, uh, CBC and uh, sorry, uh, uh, CBC and also uh, ABG. And at the same time, I would like to do a ultrasound uh, of the KUB, sir. Right. Now, uh, this uh, catheterization, um, it 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 can be like uh, some people may not uh, agree to that, right? In a newborn period, it is slightly different. In a newborn with an elevated creatinine. Um, and uh, you know, so, um, there you may you may catheterize the baby, but in an older child, here the child is like five months, it's already That's passing expensive. urine with a bit of residual volume, probably. So you may actually um, collect the sample, uh, like a urine sample, a suprapubic method, and um, 
uh, give the antibiotics if the child is passing urine. So in an older child, you may get away with uh, without a catheterization uh, because okay, the catheter sir. again can be um, causing uh, stirring up further infection if there is a real sepsis. You know? But in a newborn, it is slightly different. In a newborn with a particularly elevated creatinine, and, uh, you probably want to catheterize to stabilize this patient, right? Um, yes, sir. Now here, you have any values and parameters? Yes, sir. The, I do have the laboratory value, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, the, uh, the hemoglobin is 10.2 gram per cent. The, the, the counts are elevated, 17,100. And uh, the, uh, but however, the uh, urea creatinine were normal and the, and the electrolytes were also normal, sir. Okay. And uh, urine uh, routine culture and all? Yes, uh, urine routine, the, the, it, should, it was positive for nitrite and, uh, the, and it had 50 to 60 pus, uh, pus for the hyper feed. And the culture grew uh, E. coli, sir. So what is the next step now? What do you want to do? Uh, sir, uh, I would like to first uh, 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 treat the infection, sir. So for based on the, the yeah. uh, antibiogram pattern, sir. And uh, and once the child is uh, 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 child is negative, I would like to do a uh, MCUG to, to confirm my diagnosis, sir. Okay. My provisional diagnosis of a posterior valve, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, posterior retinal valve with UTI. So I would like to confirm my diagnosis, sir, next, the MCUG. Now, um, we told that the first method of presentation is a prenatal, and the second uh, common presentation is the neonatal period. Okay? Yes, sir. Let us say that you have a baby, newborn baby. Okay, okay sir. Who has been delivered with a suspected posterior urethral valve, and baby has not passed urine, or if there is a distension of the bladder uh, after 24 hours after birth, uh, and okay. um, the, you have been called uh, to see the baby in the newborn ward. Um, what will you, your management be? That baby probably will not have a urine infection because that's a newborn baby uh, yes, and, until you introduce something. But um, this is 24 hour old, uh, I'm never counseled antenatally, but one ultrasound showed oligodramias. And uh, now the child has got uh, this. Yes, sir. I would like to do ultrasound, uh, do a repeat ultrasound first, sir, and uh, and assess the bladder and the, the and the kidney urine uh, KUB region, sir, as well as uh, look for any other uh, the, uh, urinoma or anything. Then, uh, uh, since the child has not passed urine for twenty four hours, uh, I would still uh, I would put an infant feeding tube and would and I would like to do the assess the renal function, sir, uh, by doing a serum urea and creatinine, sir, and also I would like to do the electrolytes at that point, sir. Now, let us say that this patient had an antenatal ultrasound and then showed a hydronephrosis, antenatal hydronephrosis. Okay. Okay, sir. Now, what um, kind of hydronephrosis you would have expected in this patient? What will be the severity like uh, uh, antenatal hydronephrosis this particular patient would have had? Uh, so, so, probably uh, uh, UTD, uh, UTD mm -hmm. A2 or A3, sir. A2 or A3, usually. Okay, and um, yes, usually they could have been bilateral, but, right? Okay, sir. If it is a yes, unilateral sir. hydronephrosis, uh, when do you do the ultrasound? After birth? Uh, sir, uh, after birth, within the, the uh, three to five days, sir. More than, instead of saying within, I should say that it is after 72 hours, 40, 48 to 72 hours is when we do the ultrasound. If it is unilateral hydronephrosis, yes, sir because we want to wait for the kidneys to start producing urine and uh, yes, mature a little bit, right? In yes, the first, to, first to 48 hours, there will be a physiological oliguria mm -hmm. and then you may have a false negative ultrasounds. Yes, right? sir. yes, sir. But in this particular situation where you have a bilateral hydrourotronephrosis, you are allowed to do the ultrasound within the first 48 hours, hours itself. Yes, within, within 24 hours also sometimes, but usually 24 hours is enough. And uh, by that time, you will have a very good picture because this is not something which is going to disappear. Yes, sir. Right? So yes, sir. you want an early ultrasound and then you want to reconfirm your findings. And then uh, if the, well, if you are planning an MCU, then obviously you have to catheterize. Uh, but if the creatine is high or if the electrolytes are abnormal. Yes, sir. Then what will you do, uh, sir? The, after catheterization, I would uh, 
I would attempt to uh, correct the electrolyzer. So, so despite catheterization and uh, and despite uh, the uh, conservative management, if the creatinine continues to be high, then the child should be considered for uh, the uh, cutaneous vasectomy, sir. Oh, let us not go there straight away. Um, but you want to stabilize the child first, right? Yes, sir. So after stabilizing the child, you want to confirm your diagnosis. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, when you then after, once the child is stabilized, um, you, like you know, you know, after two or three days, you can do an MCU, MCU. Um, yes, sir. Um, under antibiotic cover. And um, MCU, how do you do an MCU? Uh, sir, the uh, the child in supine position, sir, with uh, with mild uh, uh, with minimal sedation or no sedation, the, the slowly the bladder has to be filled up, sir. So for the, the newborn uh, newborn child, so the bladder capacity would be roughly around twenty to thirty cc, sir. So the contrast has to be slowly inserted, uh, uh, slowly. Uh, sorry, sir. Slowly administered into the bladder, sir, and uh, and supine images should be taken. Uh, and also the supine images as well as the lateral images should also be taken, sir. So the child, the images should be taken at the point uh, when the child is voiding, sir. So you want to get a voiding, fill in filled face as well as a voiding face. Yes, sir. Both, sir. And what view you are interested in getting in this particular MCU? Uh, sir, the, the particularly the, the oblique view, sir. Oblique view. So why you oblique view? Uh, sir, the... Oblique view, the, the more the details will be more uh, uh, clearly made out, especially the, the bladder neck and the, the and the extent of the the, the degree of the, the, the I mean the posterior dilatation, sir. Yeah, so when you get an IP view, you get an endown appearance, and this dilated posterior urethra can sometimes superimpose on the anterior urethra, which gives a misleading appearance. So you should yes, try not to get an AP view during the voiding phase. Hmm? Yes, sir. So that's what you need to do. Right. Yes. Yes, sir. Now you sh have you got a next image MCU or anything? Show. Uh, sir, I, I have first the ultrasound. You have an ultrasound. Sir, so okay. The, what does it show? Yes, sir, the, the ultrasound says that the, the uh, both the kidneys were normal size, but the pelvic the, the pelvic algae system of both kidneys dilated the, more on the left side, uh, and both ureters now uh, dilated, and the urinary bladders so the urinary bladders uh, uh, the wall is thickened and irregular. Uh, and the final comment is bilateral hydrouterinephrosis with cystitis. So uh, these are the images given, sir. Okay. Yeah. And uh, an MCUG image is available, sir. The, the uh, sorry, the oblique films are not available, sir. Okay. Just got these films, sir. Okay. Uh, here the the here the MCUG shows uh, the the. Uh, the dilation of the posterior urethra and uh, an abrupt cutoff uh, of the, the uh, posterior urethra with uh, the small capacity bladder, small capacity irregular bladder, and uh, bilateral uh, grade 5 HUN, sir. Uh, sorry, the bilateral grade 5 uh, VU vesicular uretic reflex. Okay, so the bladder contour appears irregular. Irregular, yes, sir. Right. Can you point out with your mouse where the bladder neck is? The bladder neck hypertrophy is usually a typical feature, yeah. So bladder neck hypertrophy. This area, sir. Yeah, so that 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 is a typical feature. But if you had a um, you know in an oblique film, then you would have seen nicely that um, angulation where the actual valve appearance changes, where the valve change, uh, creates a caliber change, right? Okay, sir. Okay, and um, so this is a um, posterior urethral valve. You have confirmed the diagnosis. Now, let us say that this is a newborn baby, right? Okay, sir. Now, you have confirmed this diagnosis. How is your intervention going to be, like, depending upon what are the options you have? Uh, sir, the, if the, the, the child is clinically stable and the, and the, the uh, creatinine is normal, and if, I'm, uh, the, if the center varium is uh, well equipped, sir, uh, I would like to do uh, the... the uh, pulgration of the PUV valve, sir. Uh, if I am not well equipped, I am in a peripheral center, I would uh, do a, a, a cutaneous vesicostomy, sir. So, what are the um, options of diversion? When do you when do you actually plan a diversion in a case of a posterior valve? Uh, sir, diversion can be planned when the, the uh, uh, 
uh, when you have lack of uh, facilities, a lot of uh, equipments, one. And then uh, uh, despite doing a valve fulguration, the child is continuing to deteriorate. There is no uh, improvement of the... the no, no, not valve to... fulguration. Despite your catheterization during okay, the pre-operative period, you know, yes, the, there is no improvement. Right, yes, so the the you the you the, ure, the uremia and uh, sepsis and all are continuing despite your catheterization, yes, uh, or if it is a preterm baby, a preterm baby, yes. Even sir. in a center where you have all the equipments, yes. if there is a preterm baby, then there is a problem yes. because what is the normal? I mean, what is the usual newborn weight? What is the weight of the newborn and what size of the um, instrument they normally allow? Uh, uh, sir. The newborn weight is about uh, uh, three kgs, uh, uh, three kgs. But the uh, instruments, what we uh, uh, instruments usually it's only a five French it it allows, sir. But a uh, but a cystoscope, what we have minimal is seven point five to nine French cystoscope we have, sir. And uh, and the sectoscope we have nine point five French sectoscope we have, sir. So, so in a preterm baby it can be difficult, um, and even in a term baby if the center where you are working doesn't have the instruments then you are justified in doing a diversion. What are the types of diversions available? Uh, as a diversion in the form of a cutaneous vesicostomy or uh, or erythrostomy can be done, sir. Okay, what is the name of the cutaneous vesicostomy? The blocks and cutaneous vesicostomy, sir. Okay, how do you do that? Uh, sir, the, the, the child in supine position, the, the, a two centimeter transverse incision is marked, which is midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis. And uh, the and uh, the incision is open is open in layer. The the dome of the bladder is identified. Then the uracal ligament is uh, the uh, identified. The the part of the, the uh, uracal ligament and the and the dome the dome of the bladder is excised. And it is the and the, the open part of the bladder is sutured to the overlying fascia, sir, so that the bladder doesn't retract into the, the, the abdominal cavity again. And then the, the and the stoma is matured, sir. So it's not the anterior wall, but it is actually the uh, the level of the uracus or the uh, junction of the posterior dome and the posterior urethral wall. That so is the, where you understand dome. most. Why do you do that? And what is the particular complication you want to avoid by doing this? Uh, a retraction if you, if you into the... the anterior wall, which is much easier. Uh, what happens? What is the problem? Uh, there won't be complete drainage of the blood, sir. So there'll be stasis of urine in the blood. More than that, there is a particular complication which keeps on bothering the patient. Uh, it also affects the drainage, but uh, this uh, complication uh, can be really bothering for the child and the mother. If you do the anastomosis in the anterior wall, the posterior wall keeps on prolapsing. Okay. So the prolapse of that mucosa can cause either obstruction or it can cause bleeding and erythema and then you know, the, it can keep on causing uh, trouble, okay? Oh, okay. Uh, now, uh, what is there any disadvantage of vesicostomy compared to urethrostomy? Well, urethrostomy means like, how do you want to do urethrostomy? What type of urethrostomy? Uh, urethrostomy, a uh, multiple type. Uh, a distal urethrostomy is there, sir. Uh, proximal urethrostomy is there, or a pilostomy is there, or a, or a sober white type uh, urethrostomy, or a uh, ring urethrostomy is there, sir. What is the usual type of urethrostomy we do in a case of a posterior wall? Is it uh, uh, sober wise, sir? No, it is the loop urethrostomy. Okay. So you just bring out the loop of uh, of the ureter and then fix it onto the uh, one side. Is it done on bilateral or one unilateral? Unilateral only, so only one side, sir. Okay. Uh, so. Yeah, usually unilateral is enough unilateral. to decompress both sides. The opposite side also um, can um, can be decompressed via the bladder. Okay, so in this particular MCU, if you look at it, uh, which side your trust me, which you, would you prefer? Left side, sir. Left side is more tortuous, sir. Yeah, so so left side is left more side, tortuous. Sir. It is coming just uh, to where that uh, you know iliac fossa is there. So you make an incision in the form of like an appendix incision on the left side and then go extra peritoneal and then fix it there. You can even go do a little bit higher also, like lumbar region also incision you can do and then do a little higher urethrostomy also. But either way, both of them will decompress the bladder uh, and the opposite side. Now, are there any advantages and disadvantages of urethrostomy over a vesicostomy? Uh, 
ಸರ್ ಇರಿಟ್ರಸ್ಟ್ ಮೀ ಈಗ ಮೋರ್ ಡೆಫಿನೆಟ್ ಡ್ರೈನೇಜ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಸರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಫುಲ್ ಕೇಸಸ್ ವೇರ್ ದಸ್ ರೆಕ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಯು ಟಿ ಆರ್ ದ ಚೈಲ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ಸೆಪ್ಸಿಸ್ ಸರ್ ಬಟ್ ದ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ವಿತ್ ಇರಿಟ್ರಸ್ಟ್ ಮೀ ಇಸ್ ದಟ್ ದ ಬ್ಲಾಡರ್ ರಿಮೈನ್ಸ್ ಡ್ರೈ ಸರ್ ಸೊ ದ ಬ್ಲಾಡರ್ ಡೈನಾಮಿಕ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಬೈಲಾಟಲ್ ರೈಟ್ ಸರ್ ಬಟ್ ವಿ ಸೆಡ್ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ಡೂ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಒನ್ ಸೈಡ್ what about the vesicostomy if the vesicostomy what about is there any disadvantage of vesicostomy vesicostomy also it can also affect the interfere with the bladder dynamics sir correct so bladder vesicostomy also can interfere with the bladder dynamics and it keeps on decompressing the bladder um, whereas if you do a unilateral ureterostomy it can to some extent keep the bladder filling and emptying it can also allow the urethra to sometimes you know function a little bit urethra doesn't become completely dry and then when you come to valve fulguration um after the valve fulguration there will be some urine uh, to go via the urethra instead of having a dry fulguration which is not a right thing to have so when you do a, in this particular patient if you do a left side ureterostomy the right side also is decompressed via the bladder and then uh, okay. you do a valve fulguration and then uh, after that some urine will come out through the normal urethra then you can do a check okay. and then see whether it is gone and then you can close the ureterostomy right okay sir. so that okay, is the advantage of doing a unilateral ureterostomy trust me okay Now, is there a way um, you can tell whether the patient will benefit from ureterostomy instead of a vesicostomy in this particular child like straight away like in a newborn period you have a creatinine of 4 or 3.5 and you have catheterized the patient and uh, so can you tell uh, whether uh, this patient will benefit from vesicostomy or ureterostomy based on that so when you have catheterized the patient uh, when you have catheterized the patient um you expect the creatinine to come down if the bladder or the vesicouteric junction is not quite in a narrow or affected number 1 also the amount of hydronephrosis is um, is supposed to reduce a little bit okay so okay, if sir, both okay. of them don't happen the hydronephrosis remains or the creatinine remains bad then okay, that sir. probably shows that uh, um, um the vesicostomy alone may not decompress that well because you've already decompressed the bladder with the catheter. catheter so that is one way of telling that this patient is probably going to need a ureterostomy ureterostomy okay sir okay uh, now in this patient um, this is patient is already now 5 months or 6 months so you have all the instruments um, what are the types of valve fulgurations what are the types of in- instruments you can use for valve fulguration uh, sir uh, we can use uh, the, the pediatric cystoscope sir, which is between uh, the uh, range between 7.5 to 9 french and uh, and cause ablation of the valve with uh, with bugby bugby yeah. electrode so that is available right from uh, you know um, uh, six s so there is also a 4.56 uh, uh, ureteros is a sorry the cystoscope also cystoscope. like your ureterostomy ureteroscope yeah. it is also a straight yes, channel and then it can uh, take a 2.5 french bugby electrode it can take a laser fiber also okay. uh, so um, you know you have a 4.56 uh, french uh, newborn uh, compact uh, you know um, single channel straight channel side viewing cystoscope which can be used uh, along with either 2.5 french bugby electrode okay um, or you can use what else if the child is big uh, we can use a resectoscope a 9.5 french resectoscope yeah. is there so we can have a 9 french a 9 french resectoscope is there and in the resectoscope uh, what what kind of element what kind of current what how do you do it uh, sir uh, sir the a uh, calling slide or the or who can be used so the the type of current is it's only a the, the pure cutting current should be used and the setting should be kept as low as possible and uh, an incision should be given at uh, three areas sir the, at 12 o'clock 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock positions sir okay okay so you what how, what are the types of postural valve Uh, sir uh, as per young's classification there are three types of so, uh, uh, type 1 most commonest this is uh, the uh, which arises from the level of the virum internum and uh, and just uh, and goes towards the roof just proximal towards the sphincter uh, that is type 1 
uh, uh, type 2 is the non obstructive type which arises at level of virumentanum and blows towards the bladder neck uh, and then uh, uh, type 3 is the incomplete obliteration of the membrane so the, uh, uh, which presses as like which presents as a circular membrane with a central orifice sir. or a, is there a type 3 or, a and a b uh, sir i don't know sir i just know what yeah, uh, i mean four, uh, i mean they are all in relation to vermontanum so it can yes, be you know distal or proximal to the vermontanum but uh, uh, so what are the other names for this kind of membranes there are some other names for this uh, 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 sir known as uh, copum sir okay what is uh, that congenital uh, uh, congenital obstructive uh, 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 posterior uh, urethral membrane sir yeah so that can be one other another type of uh, you know obstruction in the posterior um, which is commonest type a type 1 sir type 1 okay and type 1 is basically which starts in the vermontanum you, you should use the terms properly okay it goes okay. distally and then fans out and then fuses in the midline okay sir so it comes from the vermontanum goes distally and then fuses in the midline mm -hmm. uh, like that and then that that may look like a membrane but usually it is it is like going to like a sail it is not yes, in yes. one plane it is in two different planes uh, it yes. starts at the vermontanum then goes distally and then comes a little bit superior and then fuses uh, there in the midline um, so that is the commonest type uh, what is type 4 uh, sir, type 4 is associated with uh, uh, prune belly syndrome, sir, is because of the kinking of the uh, ureters, uh, okay. sorry, uh, urethra, sir, posterior urethra, because of loss of support from the prostate. So it's more of a membrane, more of a membranous type. Uh, I mean, it's a, like fold. Yes, a fold, uh, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, so type 4 is associated with prune belly syndrome. Let us not go down that line. So we have we have said that there are the two or three ways, and then using a resectoscope, you have to come, you have to divide it or ablate it at two three places using yes, either sir. a cold current or diathermy. That yes, sir. Right. Now let us say that you have done that in this patient. How long you want to keep the catheter? Uh, sir, keep the catheter for uh, twenty four to forty eight hours, sir. Okay. And uh, after that. How do you want uh, to follow sir. them up? Uh, sir, I would discharge the child after removing the catheter, sir, and uh, I would uh, call back the child after two weeks. I would like to do a repeat uh, ultrasound uh, of the KUB region. I would like to do a urine routine and uh, urine routine examination, and and uh, and I'd like to uh, call the child again at uh, three months. I would like to do a uh, uh, repeat ultrasound and uh, and same urine routine, sir, and uh, and I would also like to do a MCUG at that point, sir. Okay, so you want to do a repeat MCU. Uh, why yes, do you want to do a repeat MCU? Uh, I would like to do the, I would like to see what is the, the uh, uh, assess the adequacy of the ablation, sir. The, so whether it's uh, adequately fibrated or not, sir. What do you expect, uh, sir? Uh, sir, the, in MCU, the uh, sir the the ratio of the posterior urethra to the anterior urethra should be uh, should be less than three, sir. The diameter of the, the posterior urethra to the diameter of the anterior urethra less than three. So the posterior urethral dilatation has to come down, and the anterior urethral that the, the caliber change should become less. Yes. I won't. I, I won't go into the exact cutoffs. If the posterior urethra is hugely dilated, then it will take a long time for it to come down. But okay, at least sir. it should come down to some extent, and then in relation to the anterior urethra, um, yeah, usually it is like two two point five times. Okay. Yes, if sir. it is like two times, 2.2 times, it is normal. But if it is more yes, than sir. three times, then it is abnormal. Abnormal, yes. Sir. So for if the anterior urethra is like a millimeter and the posterior urethra like a 2.5 centimeter is okay. So if it becomes like three centimeter, then it is not okay. Right? Okay. Something like that. 2.2 to 2.2 times. So up to, you know, to, um, I mean, there are different people have got different cutoffs. Some people say that it should become equal, like one is to one. Some people say it should become like one is to two. And then some people say it is one is to three. So, but anything more than 2.5 times is definitely abnormal. Okay. okay. So then what else you can tell you that uh, in addition to that um, change of caliber, what else can tell you that the, your fulguration has worked? Uh, sir, the... Uh, uh, at three months, I would not expect the vesicouteric reflex to uh, to settle down, sir, because it usually takes about one to two years for the vesicouteric reflex to uh, to settle down, sir. Okay. Uh, I would like. 
in ultrasound i would like to uh, but the hydrouter nephrosis that should come down on the uh, ultrasound sir and also the uh, the previously elevated creatinine if at all the creatinine has to normalize sir it won't become normal but it will definitely see, remain stable it won't go up again yes okay? yes sir then the, the reflux the amount of reflux can come down from oh, grade okay. 5 it can become grade 4 or grade 3 Okay, so degree of reflux can come down. And okay, what sir. about the bladder? Does the bladder change? Uh, the bladder also grows in size. Grows, so as it grows okay. in size, then the counter becomes slightly better. Okay. Uh, okay, sir. So it's becoming so thick and then so thimble, it becomes slightly better capacity and better counter the bladder uh, after. even say 3 to 4 months it, it it starts showing improvements so the you see a multiple um things which help you to decide uh, you know that whether a, a repeat cystoscopy is needed but there are some people who always do a check cystoscopy and then uh, uh, go for cystoscopic uh, assessment of the valve right yes, sir i prefer to get an mcu because cystoscopy is more expensive and then needs a ga whereas mcu can be done in the Uh, radiology department in an awake child um, and if the mcu shows good then i can award a cystoscopy so it is for three to four months and then take it further okay sir, uh, now yeah uh, uh, yeah tell me uh, sir, if the, the bladder neck is elevated sir so uh, what should the management and uh, and when should we intervene sir how it has to be managed sir yeah now along with the valve fulguration um, is there anything else uh, you will be doing i mean you may want to do Uh, sir the uh, if there is the uh, there's elevated bladder neck sir the, i would not uh, the, do a bladder neck incision at this point i would Good. like to uh, manage Good. i won't do a bladder neck incision either uh, because bladder neck is always elevated and then uh, primary bladder neck incision is totally like it's doing too much right so i would not do a bladder neck incision um, but i would uh, wait for uh, the bladder neck to slowly improve and there are some medications you can try what medications uh, alpha blockers can be given alpha sir. blockers can be used to particularly use uh, uh, on bladder neck hypertrophied patient if there is a high when do you particularly high pvr, high PVR. if you have high a high pvr then you possibly need a uh, you know alpha blockers um, some people also put these children on what other medication uh, sir the uh, The bladder relaxants also they put some oxy what are they what is the particular thing you name a thing uh, oxybutynin sir oxybutynin so what what group of medicine is that yeah. don't say bladder relaxant you give oh, it a proper anticholinergic no, sorry sir and anticholinergic anticholinergic yes, sorry so there are two type of medications anticholinergics mm. and alpha blockers which are used alpha blockers are particularly used when there is more of a bladder neck hypertrophy and postward residual Uh, whereas in a patient with a severely high trabeculated thick and bladder yeah. uh, and less of a bladder neck hypertrophy you can use an oxybutynin um, and um, you can use a combination of both okay sir some people do both uh, um, and uh, will you start these patients on this medication straight away or you want to see how they do yeah, no sir i would not start as a i would wait i would wait for the, uh, three months then uh, i would uh, start so three month uh, time follow up when you do an ultrasound then it tells you that whether the hydrouretinophrosis is improving right if the hydrouretinophrosis is improving then you are on the right track if it is not improving then you need to get a warding cystourethrogram to just Word. make sure that your valve is gone apart yes, from uh, what are the complications of valve fulguration uh, sir the valve fulguration no okay, it can give rise to the uh, as a sphincter spasm it can give rise to sphincter spasm and subsequent uh, no, 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 no. Sphin retention. not sphincter spasm that's not the term when you do a repeat mcu what do you want to see what are you doing it for uh, the uh, complete ablation of the valve so that could be remnant valve so, so there could be a residual valve. valve number 1 then what else when you use too much of current what happens that's uh, so it there is structure sir there is structure so so there are two things which you want to see one is a, a residual valve and another one is a structure um, so both will look like the same like uh, both will look like posterior thrus dilated and then the reflux is exactly the same the bladder is exactly the same 
ultrasound is not getting better. If that is the case, you have to go in for a repeat cystoscopy rather than go in for okay. any medication. But if that is not the case, and then your fulguration is absolutely fine, the urethra is only like two times dilated the or you know nice reduction in the posterior mm -hmm. and urethra uh, caliber, then you can or the, even the reflex has come down. Then you can probably look at the bladder and then um, bladder neck is hypertrophied or if the bladder is trabeculated, then you can decide what medicine you should use. Now, the other thing I wanted to ask, like, like along with the posterior valve fulguration, is there any other procedure you may contemplate? Uh, sir, I would like to do a circumcision in this yeah. child, sir. So, circumcision is something which is preferred by a lot of people. I always prefer to have it unless there is a strong feelings among the parents of to not to get into it. Okay? Because circumcision is known to reduce the UTIs and um, my child is under anesthesia, so I always get a circumcision if I can get a consent for circumcision, along with the primary valve fulguration. Okay. okay. Now, in this patient, you are following up. Uh, what are the poor prognostic factors uh, for posterior urethral valve? There uh, are some criteria, like a PARCS criteria. There are, you know, there are some four or five factors which determine that a posterior urethral valve has got a bad prognosis. So, what are those criteria? Uh, yes, sir. The, uh, sir, the, uh, antenatally, so the antenatally presence of any uh, the, the urinoma or any presence of a, a dysplastic kidney and a that is a favorable prognosis. prognosis. That's a favorable prognosis. So pop off is a favorable prognosis. Uh, so, so uh, dysplastic kidney and. Uh, yeah. So yourself. early yeah. gestation, when when something is diagnosed early in gestation, gestation. or when you have uh, this, uh, you know, cystic changes in the kidneys with hyperechoic kidneys on the antenatal scan, that is a bad prognostic factor. Okay. 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 In the newborn period, what is the pro bad prognostic factor? Uh, sir, the uh, elevated creatinine, sir. That's the particular uh, term for that. Nadal creatinine. Uh, Nadal creatinine, creatinine more than sir, more than uh, point eight so more, more than point more eight than one more, more than one one okay so what do you mean by nadir creatinine uh, the baseline creatinine the baseline uh, yeah so after catheterizing like three four days or after you know the child has been decompressed um, the creatinine is supposed to come down um, if it is more than if it remains more than one even after four five days of catheterization then that is uh, not a great thing to have then what are the things in the um, um, other factors like near postnatal factors which are poor prognostic and the, and the uh, age of presentation sir the, the younger the age is uh, the, uh, the poorer the prognosis sir yeah that's okay yeah then in an mcu what is a poor prognostic factor for example in this case uh, Presence of bilateral vesicular trach reflux is a poor prognostic factor. Yes, uh, uh, Whereas yes, presence sir, of yes. unilateral vesicular trach yeah. reflux is like a good prognostic factor. Good prog favorable problem. Okay. Yes. So bilateral VUR is a bad prognostic factor. Then what else uh, in the urine? Any urine bad prognostic factor? Uh, sir, presence of a transforming uh, uh, group alpha and B. No, more than that. In the Proteins in the urine. Proteinuria is a bad prognostic factor. Then one more thing in the bad prognostic factor in the toddler period or in on, on a five year, four, five year old. So what is that bad prognostic factor? Dribbling, daytime dribbling. Okay. So there are very clear cut bad prognostic factors. Early diagnosis, early okay. ingestion, then dysplastic kidneys in the antenatal scans. Nadal creatinine more than one, bilateral vesicutric reflux, proteinuria, then you have this daytime dribbling. Um, dribbling, daytime dribbling age of five years. Okay. Now, if there is a daytime dribbling at the age of five years, what do you suspect? A child who has been okay for two, three years suddenly start dribbling. Yes, particularly in a case of a yeah, uh, probably the child is developing a uh, gallbladder syndrome uh, and uh, overflow in control. So bladder bladder function is becoming abnormal, right? So functionally, how do you assess these patients? Uh, sir, uh, we need to do uh, the 
aerodynamic studies also. Okay. So you can do aerodynamic study. Uh, I mean, you do not have to do it in the newborn period itself, but you can have one at the age of like one year as a baseline. Then you can repeat one at the age of three or four years, and then you can repeat one at the age of you know eight or nine years, depending upon how your follow-up is. Like you may have to earlier or later, depending upon how the ultrasound. If the ultrasound wise it is holding, the cranial function is holding, then you can always withhold the. Uh, number of aerodynamics and all, um, but in a child with the daytime dribbling, definitely aerodynamics will help. What are the aerodynamic changes that can happen in the case of a posterior valve? Well? Uh, sir, the uh, early in infancy there will be detrusor hyperreflexia, sir. The, the early infancy and childhood, and uh, once the child grows, then the the, the bladder compliance improves, the, the bladder capacity also uh, increases. So, uh, and in the later childhood, the slowly the, the the bladder capacity increases and the bladder the, the bladder becomes the uh, atonic or the myogenic failure, sir. Okay. So in the early phase, it becomes like a high detrus or hyperreflexia or one of those, you know, uh, unstable contractions. We have all that in the early, early, early stages. Then later on, it can become like hyper bladder with a poor compliance also, or it can end up my failure as the words. So myogenic failure typically occurs in adolescence, and that is when the CKD starts getting worse. Okay. Sir, so, they, uh, mm. so one thing, sir. So before we go into this, so what is the role of uh, DMSA? So when we do a DMSA in this uh, assessment evaluation, sir? Yes. See, see, in a patient, any patient with vesicular reflux, a DMSA is always useful to assess the function, the the, the not the function, the um, relative function and the scarring. Okay. Yes, sir. So it gives two informations. So in this particular patient, like uh, you don't have to do it at three months, um, but if the MCU, the, if the reflux is persisting, for example, you have done a repeat MCU at uh, three months, it's persisting. Yeah. You, you yes, can sir. plan a DMSA at six months or one year, just as a baseline to see what is the uh, what is the status of scarring in the kidneys. Um, oh, and yes, um, you, you think it can be useful as a baseline for follow for further. Uh, you know how how the renal deterioration is happening. All those things it can be useful, right? Okay. Sir. Now valve bladder syndrome. What is valve bladder syndrome? Sir, uh, valve bladder syndrome is a sequel of the, the uh, uh, I mean effect of the the, the posterior urethral valve on the bladder, sir. So, the, so which is actually characterized by uh, <clears throat> the increased bladder capacity with the high filling bladder pressures and uh, and the the poor bladder sensations. Okay, how do you manage it? Uh, sir, the uh, uh, stepwise manage uh, So first, we can uh, uh, train the child for uh, proper toilet training, uh, 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 voiding at at uh, at fixed time or uh, or double voiding. So if the child is not able to uh, uh, comply to that, then the uh, uh, then we can try the medical management in the form of uh, anticholinergics. If the uh, anticholinergics fail, the next step would be uh, the planning for a, a CIC. So, the, uh, but uh, while on CIC, the child can develop uh, uh, nocturnal enuresis. So, when there is a nocturnal enuresis, then the child might de uh, need nighttime catheterization. Or when uh, when the child becomes okay, the child has a sensate urethra, or when CIC cannot be performed, so then that time uh, a mitrophenov has to be the, the uh, plan, sir. And if uh, the, uh, all this fails, then uh, the uh, augmentation cystoplasty has to be planned, sir. Uh, for planning, uh, uh, indications for doing augmentation cystoplasty is when the uh, bladder capacity is less than 75% of the expected uh, uh, volume for the age, and the, and the filling pressure is more than 30 centimeters of water, and, and the child is not able to hold urine for at least uh, three hours. Very good. So you have comprehensively described, uh, described the management of valve bladder. Uh, so initially, it's a medical management with medications, and uh, you know either it is anticholinergics or alpha blocker. You have to depend upon what state of uh, conditions you have, and then you may have to do a nighttime catheterization. And then if um, catheterization becomes a problem, you may need a mitrofenov alone. And if the bladder is getting really bad with the renal dis you know, renal dysfunction, also then you are having a high, you know high pressure bladder. Then you are a candidate. That's a candidate for uh, augmentation. Augmentation. Right. Now, in a five-year-old child, 
and during a, you know you know you are following up this child then the child has come at 5 year old what are the investigations you do like how often you follow them up how long you follow them up let us say that this child has completed the valve fulgration repeat mcu doesn't have any uh, problems and then um, you have also seen the child at one year the child is stable how often you want to see this child and what are the investigations you keep on in mind in when you come for when they come for follow up uh, sir uh, uh, i would like to follow the child at least annually sir uh, annually i would like to do a ultrasound kub with the uh, pvr and a urine routine examination sir so in urine routine microscopy i would particularly keep looking for uh, uh, proteinuria in the child and uh, and uh, once in two years I like to do a, a dmsa and uh, and have uh, and have a look at the function of the the uh, kidneys uh, and at the, the same time i would like to also do a mcug to assess the degree of uh, vur okay um now um, the you said ultrasound you said urine routine yes sir you said what else uh, sir uh, mcug and a dms no, no, no. mcug is not done every year when they come for follow up no sir regular, regular once in two years sir right? they know that once in two years also is need not needed if the child is not having urinary tract infections or persistent dilatation so once you have known that that uh, the valve is gone there is not less, less and less role for mcu unless the new problems are starting so on a regular annual follow up you do an ultrasound you do a urine routine then what else you do? serum creatinine uh, serum creatinine yeah. hospital blood urea creatinine and is that is that enough urea creatinine is enough you have to do serum electrolytes as well yeah electrolyte okay sir why particularly you are looking for which particular uh, component yeah, i uh, mean potassium sir uh, potassium then what else uh, potassium and bicarbonate sir bicarbonate bicarbonate so um, these kids are potential risk for ckd what is the ckd risk in child with the posterior urethral valve That's a, a CKD is around fifty to sixty percent, sir. Yeah, very high. So they often have acidosis. Uh, so you may have to put them on bicarbonate and various things, right? So that is number uh, one thing. Then what else you want to do apart from this? One more blood test you may have to do. Maybe two more, but one important thing you have to do. Not very less, sir. Part of CKD, um, they they have something else also. The, as a part of ckd they can have renal dysfunction electrolyte dysfunction then they will have one more thing uh, which is part of the kidney function the kidney has got several functions one is uh, filtration yeah anemia hemoglobin sir yeah so they hemoglobin. need to be checked up for hemoglobin hemoglobin most of them are anemic and most of them may need a uh, you know iron supplements and various things they may also need a calcium and phosphorus and alkaline phosphatase because some may, some of them develop you know this uh, bone changes yes, um, you renal know renal osteodystrophy and renal osteodystrophy and also they they have to be looked up for all that uh, now in an older child you can do one non invasive test for the bladder function what is it the urophlometry sir urophlometry with pvr yeah urophl pvr is a very useful test particularly in an older child you know the, the typical child who come dribbling at 5 years so you can do a uroflow pvr and then if that gives you a lot of idea about how you are your you know you the, the the urine flow is how the bladder is functioning how the PA, bladder is emptying of the pvr okay okay sir so your your regular follow up during every year you are going to get them hemoglobin rft electrolytes yes. urine routine looking for a protein then ultrasound kub then uroflow pvr and okay. also you need to do one particular thing to check physically what is that this is also a function of the kidney yeah. uh, sir the, the the height and weight so the growth of the child yeah of course growth and weight, weight you have to check but this particular general examination you have to do because that is also affected by the kidney you don't need a, you don't need anybody else you can yourself uh do that as a part of a general examination
you often have a, a, a you know follow up along with your some other colleague another department what department colleague you have this patients following up nephrologist nephrology nephrology, nephrology. so nephrology what are the things they titrate what are the things they look for apart from your you know renal function they some of these children are attending nephrology clinic and urology clinic okay yeah and in hypertension uh, yeah hypertension hypertension so you have to check for blood pressure also so during every annual visit you have to check for all these things uh, of course you are going to involve a nephrologist but if you are in a center where the nephrologist is not there you can yourself check all these things and then you can uh, refer to a nephrologist if one of them is abnormal okay so okay. obviously you should know the 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 bp range for each age and uh, many of these children may be on iron bicarbonate and antihypertensives they may also be on your own medications like you know uh, alpha blockers and uh, anticholinergics you also need to know how long to continue this medicine sometimes you may have to stop the anticholinergic after after uh, you know one or two years uh, because you don't want to yourself create a, uh, a tonic bladder right a parallel so, bladder yes sir yeah okay so that's what about it now if you uncheck your screen um i may want to show uh, this uh, uh, i mean uh, you 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 want to see a valve fulguration right uh, sir yeah yes sir uh, sir so uh, how do i uncheck sir just sorry, go, sir, to, go to sh- uh, sir, yeah, yeah. go to share screen and stop share yeah yes okay. sir yes sir now let me see whether i can uh, can Oh, your screen is still there, huh? No, sir. My screen is not there, sir. Okay. Let me see. Just go down. Oh, I am not able to show my screen. My desktop. Where is my desktop? So you should be able to show, sir. You can try now. Your co-host only. No, I am still seeing his screen only. No, sir. You have stopped sharing. See that is still come back. How come I got your screen right? Is that your screen? Ah, uh, sir, no, sir. I've actually I've closed the presentation, sir. Sir, you have to open. Sir, you have to open your uh, video in the background. then you start sharing the screen i think you are selecting the same old facebook you are selecting that's why the same screen is coming yeah when i start share share screen it says that uh, this particular window is there then whiteboard no, iphone ipad all those things are there post attend zoom so you 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 open the window uh, your uh, whatever you want to show you open that in the background then you start sharing yes it's coming now are you seeing my desktop yeah yes sir yes sir yes sir okay the ppt has come yes sir yeah so i just want to show up one particular video not all of it uh, yeah so this is the view i was telling right yes, can sir. you see this y- yes sir that is the oblique view which i was mentioning where you can see the posterior urethra dilated and uh, there is an anterior urethra there so there is a caliber change you can see and this particular patient has got unilateral reflex probably into a dysplastic kidney because looking at the calices and that looks like a contracted kidney so this is probably a vord case right valve okay. unilateral reflux and dysplasia and uh, and that is the appearance of a posterior urethral valve in a case of a, you know when you do a cystoscopy it appears like a pale um, uh, mem- membrane like thing starting from the, uh, starting from the vermontanum so it comes from the vermontanum you divide it at 5 o'clock 6 o'clock and then at 12 o'clock at three different places either using a hot or cold current 
um, and uh, you have two or three different types of uh, scopes like this is a 4.5 6.5 um, compact uh, newborn cystoscope uh, so this has got a, just like a urs through which your 2.5 bugby will go is yes, the bugby electrode has got a little tip and the bugby electrode here you attach exactly with uh, what you attach for your torp so that that uh, same diatherm can be used now the resectoscope is slightly different the resectoscope has got different cable you have to attach it here somewhere here so it is not it's a different cable uh, which goes directly into the diatherm uh, machine and then that is an 8.59 french resectoscope that can be used in a more than 3.5 kilos and um, we have this different electrodes but i prefer to use the um, the hook shaped electrode and the, the ones on this side are the cold knife um, where you don't use need a diatherm okay so this is a um, um, you know the, the, the scope and um, uh, but the electrode I, i really don't want to show this I, i'll go to the next one uh, now this is a patient who has had a vesicostomy if you see and then vesicostomy um, um, i keep the setting high only i don't keep it low because i keep a small current, a little burst only but i want to divide it not that is a sphincter which we are crossing so the distance between the sphincter and the bladder neck is very little so we um, have to be really careful not to drag your pulgration all the way to the uh, sphincter okay so the so as you come back from the bladder you first locate the vermontanum and then from the vermontanum uh, it starts coming the type 1 valve mm -hmm. starts distally and then that is the vermontanum and then the valve starts here on either side and then it fuses in the midline okay and then you come further you see the valve just slipping out of your vision so that is the valve which is looking like a membrane but it's basically it started from the vermontanum okay, okay and that is pale white and whereas your sphincter is pink so that is the difference and sphincter is like a circle so that is the bugby electrode the problem with the bugby electrode is you have to push to the valve you have to you know touch the valve and then hold it at exactly the right place and that becomes difficult uh, so you have to do very slow uh, and then just do little by little small small punctures and then join them together so doing a bugby electrode needs a lot of um, steady hand and i think 12 o'clock has been um, fulgurated in this patient now i have taken this uh, resectoscope just to show that this is the resectoscope with the diatherm um, again i have rotated it so that i just want to check whether the bugby did the trick um so uh, that's the sphincter we are crossing and then we have to come back and then uh, from the bladder neck and see where we have actually fulgurated earlier so that is the place where uh, the valve is now now once the toll clock is done your vision slightly becomes better you the, this is the advantage you can hook you can see whether you can hook any remaining fold this kind of um, hooking is not possible uh, when you have a bugby electrode But and in the newborn see. period most of them are able to use only bugby electrode so that is why people feel that they have done incomplete and they always go for a second look where they can when the baby has grown and they have, they want to uh, see whether they have fulgurated it properly now we can see that it has separated two sides two leaflets are there okay so now we can rotate the um, the, the element to either 5 o'clock or 7 um, o'clock and then we can uh, we can uh, slowly you know do the other side also um, so uh, the similar thing is code knife for some reason it has stopped i admitted anil takwani and then it stopped yeah no this is a yeah so that that, that the 12 o'clock has been divided now and then uh, we can turn it and then do the 5 o'clock or 7 o'clock um i think i will uh, that is a rotation this uh, that is rotation and then when you rotate it you keep your vermontanum in the floor so you have to make sure that your vermontanum is in the flow and then uh, you can you if you apply the current only at the place of the valve you should not have any bleeding because the valve is avascular whereas if okay. you apply it anywhere else you will have bleeding and then if you if you apply it too much also you will have a stricture so you, you really don't want to have a stricture you want don't want to have a residual valve but you just want to apply enough current only at the point where you have to divide it okay 
and then the the cold knife we, this find, kind of uh, structure risk is not there so when you use a cold knife um, you can simply so that valve is gone you can see that that particular point is it's quite thick leaflet that one and then that is a cold knife and then um, the i mean in a same patient i just for the demo purposes i used all three just to see how different is one feels so here there is no need for diathermy and then there's no need for glycin also so you can actually do it with uh, i mean a lot of people do it with saline um it can be done with saline in and it's a small um, procedure the short procedure so uh, so that that is a cold knife where we can actually uh, use it and this is a 5 o'clock being done it doesn't matter which you do first some people want to do the 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock first and then at 12 o'clock i prefer to do the 12 o'clock first because in case some bleeding happens at least i have divided the um, the main obstructing leaflet the fire, the the 12 o'clock and then the both leaflets have fallen apart um so i prefer to do 12 o'clock first because if there is a bleeding then i know that that particular area is gone now after you have divided the valve it looks like you know a lot of things are hanging from all over the place and um, because these air vascular leaflets are hanging from two or three different places um it it looks like a torn um cloth basically i mean or or a cotton but that particular appearance should be there only at the level of the posterior urethral valve yeah just you come out of it and then the urethra should be absolutely normal so you have the habit of retracting it uh, immediately afterwards so that is like divided valve in all three places and then some people test for like this but this test is particularly like pressure avoiding even with the valve sometimes you can appreciate it but some people just check like this for your their own satisfaction okay so i prefer to use a cold knife rather than a uh, rather than a hot knife okay so that is uh, where we are we are stopping so we will stop our discussion here if there are any particular questions or any points to be raised we can always discuss dr ramesh babu i have one question yes good evening sir good evening i have one question yes have you come across situation where you your patient on removal of the feeding tube or post wall uh, feeding tube uh, wall filtration feeding tube or catheter fail to void uh, if yes sir, then what could be the reason what can be the reason and uh, what do you think uh, should be consider the child for uh, another catheter for couple of days and catheter free trial or anything else i have never had this problem um to be honest with you like i i i always kept the catheter for like 2 to 3 days maximum and then when you once you remove after 48 hours uh, they they just void they don't have this they don't go into retention now oh, recently 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 sir in one of my patient mm. which i have seen only first time and uh. i was about to travel for chennai mm. uh, apollo uh, the mm. day before i remove the on third day second third day the feeding tube and uh, to my surprise the child fell to bed now child was definitely very uh, to start with quite sick but then we waited till the sickness uh, reduced uh, significantly and uh, well stabilized and thereafter only on seventh or eighth day we did the valve fulguration now uh, at that time as i was to travel next day the only option with me was to put a feeding tube again explain the relatives that uh, i will be i'm coming after say 5 6 days i will call you people back and then uh, we'll see that how the child respond and to my uh, fortunate and the patient's for, uh, family fortunate uh, on 5th uh, 6th day when i came back i gave a feeding tube pre trial and the child uh, void successfully Wait, so probably be, some edema was still there weakness. one is that uh, could be edema could be uh, generalized weakness spasm, sir. or uh, some anything else could yeah. be could be edema usually edema okay. now one of the things which we didn't discuss is these particular patients may have difficulty in passing a feeding tube even during valve fulguration sometimes after the procedure is over you want to put a catheter or feeding tube it won't go in because it keeps on coiling in the posterior urethra mm -hmm. against the bladder neck hypertrophic bladder neck and keeps on coming back towards you it's a bit like that you know ureteric catheter coiling so this is a real nuisance and then if you have a um, scope again you pass the scope put a guide wire and then wire, yeah. guide wire you can thread it over like like a needle how you do it now same thing same things are happened to me in this particular case which also i come across first time that after my wife fulguration i have to again rescope the child 
put a uh, guide wire and over that i put a feeding tube uh, yeah. i was thinking maybe uh, some other problem could be there but to again my surprise now child has completed almost five and a half or six months and he's growing nicely only once he came with the a kind of a dehydration and acidosis i think you have already discussed with the students so yeah. you can uh, put that yeah. out across yeah so we have discussed all that uh, we have discussed different aspects of valve fulgration fal follow up uh, you know how how you follow up how often you follow up everything we have discussed and then urodynamics the role of urodynamics valve bladder syndrome we have discussed everything um, okay. so very very important very, for the for the residents in the future urologist that you keep watch at least in initial days on this uh, kid with frequent follow up on the aspects of the uh, sepsis dehydration and acidosis which you can uh, get idea if you or child or your pediatrician who is treating this child is in a good contact with you uh, then uh, you will get idea uh, if the child is failing to thrive uh, having irritability a lot of nausea vomiting loss of appetite and uh, rather than the gaining weight if they don't uh, show that kind of findings you have to definitely consider underlying uh, a kind of a sepsis or uh, dehydration and acidosis and uh, that what uh, i come across a couple of time very quite early in the period and with the help of a pediatrician we treated those patients uh, <coughs> of acidosis and dehydration and could save so my request to resident those who are listening this uh, excellent uh, presentation or lecture and discussion by very very extremely expert person you all are lucky that you have a dr ramesh babu a person uh, who is uh, uh, giving you such a huge time uh, so take the advantage of that and see that in future that whenever you take a patient of osteoarthritis under your treatment considering they consider them that it is not a one time act of fulgurating the valve because that is one of the most easiest uh, part of the treatment of a valve patient uh, but subsequently you should be committed and you have to take the patient's relative on parents in the confidence that their commitment toward the child only will be able to save the child going into the further problem our motive our, and and i my with my 21 experience uh, at the practicing in single place with our excellent motivation and our commitment we can we can definitely not drastically but little bit reduce the overall incidence of going these patients into the ckd which is still many of the times whenever we discuss with the internationally uh, i repeatedly ask them that uh, how many years these patients remain in your follow up so can you give me a 5 year 10 year down or 15 year down the line follow up because wall patients if not followed for at least 10 years it is very difficult to say uh, about the overall outcome of those patients so with that uh, little bit of uh, uh, request to all of you your future urologist please show the commitment toward the patient uh, and the try best to motivate the parents sir thank you very much uh, on thank behalf you, thank of you dr prakani uh, thank you dr jain and all of the residents to give uh, this such a excellent uh, insight into the post growth wall and uh, um, helping uh, helping all those uh, residents to understand thank you to... thank you very much thank you right. thanks dr nitesh thank you sir thanks a lot it was a very Bye. wonderful and excellent class thank Bye. you for your inputs and your time Bye. thank you. it was a nice presentation thank you sir thank you anil sir for joining and giving yeah. your comments sir thank nitesh, you sir uh, nitesh so you were doing extremely well in a very tough and difficult time uh unfortunately i could not uh, i could i joined for a while but then i started getting the phone calls for my uncle and so i have to i know what you are going through sir <laughs> so luckily uh he is still there and uh, struggling but hope so right okay thank you uh, nitesh thank you, sir. thank you thank you bye 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 thank you, thank you, you. Anil, sir thanks thanks